Well, my next guest is in Britain. It's Professor John Lee, who's a retired English pathologist and who was formerly clinical professor of pathology at Hull York Medical School. He's presented in television documentaries, in fact, on anatomy on Channel 4. And Dr Lee has, in the comparatively recent past, criticised the British government's uh, response and its approach to the COVID-19 pandemic. And he joins me now. Professor Lee, welcome to the programme. What are your primary criticisms of the British government? Well, I think it fundamentally goes back to a very ancient dictum, the Hippocratic dictum, which is first do no harm. So in medicine, you, the idea is you shouldn't do anything to a patient or even to a population without being sure that the benefits that, of whatever it is that you're doing are going to outweigh the harms. And in my opinion, in response to this new virus, uh, we've embarked on courses of action which haven't been assessed for their harms. And it's pretty clear already, and it's been pretty clear for months, that the harms are going to greatly outweigh the damage caused by the virus itself. And in medicine, we have a name for it when you do things where you haven't properly assessed things, and that's negligence. So I feel that the government's approach to this whole epidemic has been medically negligent. When you say uh, the Hippocratic Oath of do no harm, um, and then you talk about harm because the British government you say is negligent, do you mean medical harm or do you mean harm to the economy, to the mental state of, of the citizenry, uh, the, the lack of uh, cancer treatments and so on that are going to be lost? Is that where you're coming from? These are all harms, of course, aren't they? These are all harms. But I mean, specifically, if we just focus on medical harms, on harms to health, the whole purpose of things like lockdown uh, and you know, face masks and restrictions and social distancing and so on are to ostensibly to improve the health of the population to prevent them becoming ill from this particular virus. So you have to say, have these measures actually improved the health of the population or have they decreased it? And you can't really, dis you can't really dissociate uh, the economic harms from the health harms. I mean, no country has ever made the health of its population better by downgrading its economic status. So if you damage the economy, you damage health. And in this particular case, not only have we massively you know, hit the economy, which will have massive knock-on effects on health, but we've also directly harmed people's health by, you know, as you say, the mental, the mental health effects or the acute medical effects, whereby the actual health service itself has only been functioning at a fraction of its capacity. Um, and actually all this in the name of trying to control the virus, which really the idea of control for is a bit of a myth. So yes, I mean, all those things contribute to harms. So there is a group here in Ireland, for instance, which is called the Zero Covid Group, medics who, who believe that you get to zero Covid. I saw one of them on television fairly recently who said, if you listen to me, we will be at zero Covid by Christmas. Is zero Covid a possibility, a probability or what? Dream. It's cloud cuckoo land. I mean, the fact is when a virus goes out into the environment, there are billions and trillions of these virus particles now out there. They've been amplified uh, by the biological factories that are our bodies um, into huge numbers of these viruses that are out there. And you have to remember that viruses are spread around the world uh, and have maintained themselves in the population uh, when populations are at a much lower, have been over most of history, at a much lower density than they are now. So now that this virus has got out there and has become essentially endemic in the population, we will never, ever go to zero COVID again. It's completely impossible to eradicate it. What we'll have to do is live with it and come into equilibrium with it. And the actions that we're taking, the lockdowns and so forth, all they're doing is delaying the time it takes, or at least yeah, they're, they're increasing the time it takes to come into equilibrium with the virus, while at the same time causing huge harms, which we didn't need to cause. Professor Lee, um, as, as a, a quasi-historian, um, obviously I would have read of the Black Death in, in, in the Middle Ages and something that affected Ireland but the whole world, the, the Great Spanish Flu of 1918 and so on. Is that where we're at? Are we at 21st century Black Death, Spanish Flu? We're orders of magnitude, or certainly away from the Black Death. I mean, the Black Death killed maybe one in three or more of the people it infected. So it was a very serious disease. 
And in fact, the government actions that were taken around that time, for example, in London, were the idea of it was to improve people's health, but they explicitly downgraded the health of the population. They locked people in their homes so that everybody in that house died of the, of the plague. And they killed all the cats and dogs because they were convinced that cats and dogs were spreading it. In fact, it was rats and rat fleas that were spreading it. So actually killing the cats and dogs allowed the rats to proliferate and actually made the situation worse. Governments don't understand these things well enough to take the right actions. So a sensible government will do nothing until it's got overwhelmingly good evidence that the action it's taking is going to bring benefit to the population and not cause harms. And that's been the antithesis of what we've had this time. Governments have taken enormous, unprecedented actions on the basis of evidence which simply doesn't stack up and in fact shows the very opposite of what they're doing. So in a way, history is repeating itself. The, the Black Death was a, was a case of a really nasty disease where government actions didn't help. The COVID crisis is an example of quite a nasty flu virus. It's well within the envelope of many years within the last 30. So it's really nothing exceptional. It's not, it's not that it isn't a nasty virus. It is a nasty virus, but it kills mainly people whose life expectancy is already low. And it hardly kills anybody who's not already ill, whose life expectancy otherwise would be quite high. So it's within the envelope in terms of its severity and in terms of the number of deaths it's caused of many other years in the last 30. So really to take these actions on that basis and to pretend that now that it's out of the bag, now that Pandora's box is open, to pretend that we can somehow eradicate it from society is simply scientific or medical nonsense, in my opinion. Uh, I have to tell you, Professor Lee, you've cheered me up no end by saying old people like me are on the way out already, thanks to COVID. But let's talk, let's talk about me for just a moment, all right? Um, since St. Patrick's Day, March 17, do you unbelieve us? Um, St. Patrick's Day, since then, I really haven't been out of my house. And then they tell me I can play golf, which is wonderful, because I'm unlikely to spread it uh, in, in the open field and spread it. Now they tell me I can't play golf. Now they tell me I can't play tennis. Now they can't tell me I can't visit my grandchildren. So the damage being done to certainly the older population, as well as everybody else, is is awful. And and tell me, it is. Please tell me there is another way. Yeah, I completely agree with you. And by the way, I'm not in any way encouraging old people to be on the way out. Both of my parents are 85, and I hope they'll be here for a lot longer. But um, the, the the point is in whose name are these actions being taken? If I'm in my 80s, as exactly as you've just said, I do not want to be locked in my house and forbidden to see my family and told who I'm allowed to hug. I mean, is that really a job for governments? Or is the job for governments to give us the information and allow us, as we normally do, to make risk assessments on our own bat? Now, some people may wish to hide behind the sofa and they may think that's a reasonable way to live their life. But most people, I would suggest, actually feel that there's a balance to be had in life in terms of risks and benefits. And if the risks are of a certain level, but the benefits of seeing your family and doing all the things that make life worth living are taken away from you, I cannot see myself how that can be presented as health advice. I mean, it's, it's just the opposite of health advice. And I think there is another way. The other way is that given that the vast majority of the population and certainly all the working age population who are not otherwise ill, um, are at very low risk from this virus, very low risk indeed from this virus, much lower risk than flu at those age groups. Um, they should be allowed to carry on their lives as normal. And I mean old normal, not this ridiculous idea of a new normal. You, you can't rewrite the rule book of human interaction overnight. It doesn't, biology doesn't work that way. So they should go back to the old normal. For people who are in the, in the higher risk groups, that is the older you get, the more risk you've got. And I should emphasize that the older we get, the more risk we are at, from all diseases. You know, we're more risk from cancer, we're more risk from flu, we're more risk from heart disease. The point is COVID is no different from that. As we get older, we're at more risk from that. That's a pathological commonplace, we all know that. So what the government should be doing is by all means, properly correlate the information and put the information out there and explain to people what their risks are. But the idea of compelling people to do certain actions for their own good is simply, is simply the justification that we hear throughout history and throughout the world from totalitarian states. Do this because it's for your own good. It's not a healthy way to run a society and we should not be doing it in liberal democracies. I, I'm really glad you got there. 
as a professor of uh, uh, pathology, I, uh, becoming a Democrat. My hero, Winston Churchill, said that democracy isn't great, but it's the best form of government we've discovered so far. What we have in this country is policemen now stop me in my car and tell me where am I going to go. There is a suggestion if I if I have a pint of stout in the street, they're going to charge me, uh, they're going to fine me 80 pounds or whatever. It, it, and already Britain is, is attempting to break international law, admittedly for a different reason, but for the first time in its history, break international law. Is there a worry for you because it seems to me that you're thinking about it. Is there a worry for you that at some future date a government might well use these kind of, of rules, regulations and so on for the wrong reasons? Well, I, I actually think they're using them for the wrong reasons right now. I mean, there are, there are rights uh, that we thought were inalienable in, in, in liberal democracies, including the right to freedom, to travel, to, to go around to associate with who we want to. And those rights have been summarily taken away in this crisis on the basis that it's for, our, for everybody's good, but without the evidence. And frankly, you know, it's very, it's very worrying. Viruses regularly mutate. We regularly get uh, new types of virus coming, new types of pathogens coming. If every time something that people are a bit worried about, uh, or some people are a bit worried about, comes out like this, we're going to be locked down and have all our liberties taken away. It really begs the question, what sort of society we're going to be living in? I think at least part of the reason for this is that creeping up in society over the last 20, 30 years has been what I and many others would, would, would regard as excessive risk aversiveness. So nobody's willing to take any risk with anything in case they get the blame. And of course, the information technology, which allows news to be beamed around the world all the time, allows the blame to be apportioned on a sort of second by second basis. So people are very averse to that. And we have the unedifying uh, spectacle at the moment of the politicians not being willing to make any decisions in case they'll be blamed for getting the wrong one and trying to hide behind the scientists. At the same time that the government scientists who are tasked with actually trying to cut through this Gordian knot simply won't take any responsibility either and they want to delegate it back to the politicians. So our institutions are dysfunctional and not working at the moment because nobody's willing to take the responsibility which says this is the wrong approach to what we're doing and instead of engaging in an exercise of sort of political and scientific and medical backside covering which is what I think we're witnessing we need to as I say cut the Gordian knot and agree that actually the evidence does not support these courses of actions. So we should revert to you know, pretty much normal actions, maybe with a bit of help for people who want to shield. And guess what? The sky will not fall. The sky will stay up there and life will actually be a heck of a lot better for a heck of a lot more people. So you know, this is the approach we've been taking is simply wrong. Um, and now, you know, now we're trying to follow through a narrative and justify the approach we've been taking, but it's going to require some courage. Um, yeah, or maybe in some place, some civil unrest to get us out of it, because it seems to me that the governments are paralysed and they're only going to respond to when people say they've had enough. Um, and, you know, I was hoping by writing articles about this from the beginning of the lockdown, that I lived in a country where rational discussion and rational scientific debate would be able to cut through this. But in fact, contrary views have been censored since the beginning of the whole epidemic. So it's not really been possible to have a rational debate in public, which is something I called for right back in April. Um, and the consequences of that are what you can see now. When you lose rational debate, you lose perspective, you lose common sense, you lose the ability to see the big picture, which I think is the most important thing. The big picture clearly says COVID is not the plague. The, uh, you know, the average age of death from COVID is higher than the average age of death from all causes in the UK. So you know, it is not wiping out people who shouldn't be being wiped out in that sense. It's taking people who are at the stage of life where they're going to be taken by, uh, you know, by, by diseases. So the fact is, however you cut it, however you cut this thing, um, this approach is the wrong approach and we should not be doing it, but it's gonna require courage to change direction. And I just hope we can find some politicians somewhere who can find that courage before it's forced on them. All right, perhaps you're looking for Winston Spencer Churchill, really, to solve the problem. Professor, all I have to say, um, you've enlightened me but you haven't cheered me up. Thank you so much for joining me.